<laughs> well, thank you very much for having me. Just to give you a little info about myself, my name is Peter T. Lin. And I say T because there's actually two Peter Lins in the orchid world. Uh, and sometimes I'm known as the other Peter Lin. Uh, <laughs> but the Peter Lin uh, that's out there is uh, from Texas, and he grows primarily Phalaenopsis and right. PAFs. So uh, we get confused a lot. I go to places and speak, and they say, oh, I loved your last talk on Phalaenopsis, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, no, I'm Peter from uh, California. So, uh, but I like to refer to him as the other Peter Lin because I'm older, and I, I'm more original than he is. <laughs> I am taller, yeah. So it's been a number of years that we've corresponded, but the last year was the first time we met in person uh, in California. He came to speak at the Orchid, Orchid Digest Speakers Day, and so we have a photo of the two of us standing next to each other, <laughs> proving that uh, there are two Peter Lins. <laughs> okay, so today my talk is on mini cats, and the mini cats have been my favorites for a long, long time. Uh, I started growing orchids when I was uh, 17, uh, many, many years ago, uh, and the first love of orchids was through mini cats. So my first slide just gives you a little representation of what mini cats are all about. And whoa, wait, hey. Uh, those aren't orchids, but they are mini cats. I threw that in there just to make sure you're all awake and you know that those are not orchids. Uh, but this is a better slide of what uh, you might see within mini cats. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about why do you want to grow mini cats. We'll look at the species, uh, primary hybrids, some early hybrids, and the current hybrids of today. Uh, and those include both splash petals and spots. Uh, we'll look at micro mini cats, which is uh, an area of interest of mine that uh, uh, I'm doing some hybridizing in. I'll talk about culture and repotting and uh, any questions and answers at the end. But I like to hold informal talks, so if you happen to have a particular question about a slide or a, uh, a photo, just yell it out and we'll take care of it then. Uh, one other caveat I'm going to talk is uh, I'm using all of the old names for the genera. <laughs> <laughs> so even though almost everything is in is, are now Cattleyas, I'm still going to refer to them as Sophronitis, Lelias, and Cattleyas. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the reasons why I like to grow mini cats is because they're small and compact. So, uh, you know, like many of you, uh, I continue to buy more and more orchids, uh, and I buy more orchids than I kill. So I always need more space. So they're small and compact. And so here's a photo of a standard size cat Leia on the left, and on the right is a mini cat. And I can fit three or maybe four mini cats in the space of a standard size cat. Uh, they can flower more than once a year. Because of some of the species in the background of the hybrids, uh, they can sometimes bloom twice a year or even three times a year. They are available in most of the cat Leia flower colors. Uh, the only two colors that are not really prevalent in mini cats would be white and green. They grow and bloom faster than standard cat layers, uh, so that's important from a breeding standpoint and from a commercial standpoint. Uh, a lot of times uh, cat layers will take five to six years to bloom from seed. Uh, mini cats you can get from three to four years to bloom. Uh, many of the hybrids are temperature tolerant, uh, and that's important for people in different parts of the country. Uh, a lot of the hybrids do contain Sophronitis, so those need the cooler side of the spectrum, uh, but there are some warmer growers as well. So let's look at the mini cat species. Uh, the first one is Cattleya luteola, uh, and it uh, is a fairly compact plant, maybe about five or six inches tall. Uh, the flowers are about two inches wide, and there can be up to six or seven flowers on a single inflorescence. Cattleya walkeriana. Uh, this is a compact plant with fairly large flowers. They can be four inches or more across, and they bloom very close to the base of the plant. One of the uh, criticisms of mini cats is that uh, they are often not fragrant. Uh, because of the species like Sophronitis and some Lelias, 
they have no fragrance, but Cattleya walkeriana is very fragrant. So if you're looking for fragrant mini cats, look for uh, Cattleya walkeriana. Uh, it does come in several color forms, uh, including a semi-alba, alba, and cerulea. Of course, my favorite is Sophronitis coccinea. Uh, I have a, a small greenhouse devoted to Sophronitis at my house, uh, and I grow uh, many, many plants. Uh, most of the plants I have are from Japan, uh, where they've been line bred for a number of years. Uh, most of them are probably tetraploids, uh, although there's probably some triploids in there as well. Here's another one here. Uh, the flowers are very long lasting. They can last uh, up to two months in bloom. And they typically bloom around December, January, February time period, although you can have later blooming ones um, as well. They're typically only one flower per inflorescence, but I have some varieties that will have two flowers on a single inflorescence. There's another one there. And so in the breeding uh, of, of the reds and oranges, uh, most of the times the Sophronitis coccinea is in the background of those hybrids. Another one here. They, they have very, uh, can have very, very full shapes. Uh, the one maybe fault would be the lip is fairly narrow, uh, but in breeding that with other full-lipped varieties, the hybrids can be, um, ha have fuller lips. There's another one that uh, is from Japan. Uh, those flowers are uh, almost uh, seven centimeters wide, almost two and, two and three quarters of an inches across. And the plant only grows four inches tall. So, you know, a lot of people come to me and say they want to grow Sophronitis coccinea. And it is a little bit of a tricky plant, uh, but I've spent the last 10 years trying to perfect my growing method for these. Uh, and I can narrow it down to, there's two criteria in terms of, of getting these plants to thrive. One of the most important things is that you must have a strong root system for these plants. Uh, they don't seem to form roots very often, usually once a year, usually in the summer or fall, you'll start to see a flush of new roots. And so you have to, throughout the year, be able to maintain those roots and not have them rot. Uh, I grow most of my Sophronitis coccinea in New Zealand sphagnum moss and in clay pots. Uh, and I usually enlarge the hole on the bottom and I also do not pack the moss all the way to the bottom of the pot. So there's air space underneath so that the, the root zone has plenty of air circulation. Now I also uh, recommend using a pure water source because the Plants do not like uh, heavily salted water or you know, water with a lot of minerals in it. So I use um, reverse osmosis treated water. Uh, I also have to change the moss every year. You cannot let the moss go longer than a year. Uh, and uh, if you're growing in moss, you also have to be very careful about fertilizing because the moss tends to collect salts and fertilizer. So it's important to flush the moss on a monthly basis uh, and, and apply the fertilizer in a very weak solution. Uh, let's see, and then uh, the second criteria is that because they come from a cooler area in Brazil, uh, there needs to be a differential at nighttime, uh, at least 20, 25 degree difference between day and night. So I grow in Southern California, and my greenhouse will often reach into the 90s during the summer, uh, and that's fine. Uh, they can take the warmer temperatures during the day as long as it cools down at night. So uh, in the summer when it's 100 degrees, we'll cool down to 70 degrees at night. So there's a 30 degree differential. So that's why a lot of people um, in the south, the uh, southeast, have a tricky time with it, and, um, because they do not have the night cooling uh, uh, temperatures. Peter? Yes. With a mature, with a fairly large plant like that, uh -huh. do you literally, when you repot it every year, do you literally strip all the old sphagnum away? Yeah, the question is and when I re... And that doesn't destroy the roots? Or yeah, when the question is when I repot these, do I take all the moss off and does that uh, hurt the root... Uh, hurt the root ball when I do that. 
You know, it's, moss is an easy medium to work with uh, in most cases with the sophronitis. And so I do remove just about all of the moss because the, the remaining moss can become toxic after a while. Uh, but I'm usually very careful about it. You know, I will pick the moss strands out between the roots. Uh, and so, uh, and then when I repack the moss in, I will kind of insert the moss between the roots so that the, the roots are, you know, breathing throughout the moss. Um, the, one thing, the one thing I forgot to mention also is the watering of these. Uh, a lot of people think that they, they like to be kept very moist and, and almost wet. I have found in my experience that they actually do better on the dry side, especially during the summer when it's hot and warm. So I, I will go to the point where I, I will almost let them wilt. The leaves will actually desiccate before I water again. The moss becomes dry uh, and then I will water again because uh, it's much better to have the roots um, dry out uh, versus rotting the roots. The dried out roots will take up water as soon as they're watered. A rotted root is dead. So <laughs> you're not gonna be able to do anything to revive the plant. So I actually keep them on the dry side. Yes? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry? Uh, what size pot do I use? I try and use the smallest pot possible. Uh, usually they're in two to three inch size clay pots. Uh, Sometimes when I let them go into a four inch pot, uh, the, the center of the moss root ball g gets too wet and I start to lose part of the plant. So if the, if the plant gets so large that it needs a four inch pot, I will usually divide it and then repot it back into a three inch pot. Yes? So if the plants are small and compact and if you had a small collection, you could just carry the tray into an air conditioned bedroom at night. <laughs> <laughs> you, the, yeah, the question was, uh, could you just move the plants into an air-conditioned room at night? Uh, I guess you could try that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do have to keep up the humidity, though. Um, okay, now this is another form of coccinia that I found in Japan. Uh, I've been to the Japan Grand Prix show four times now, and uh, there are a couple of Japanese vendors that sell Sophronitis coccinia, and he exhibited these here, uh, and they're actually even smaller than the type form, and you can see the flowers are quite round. Uh, so this received an AM of 86 points uh, a couple years ago, uh, and it's one of my favorite plants to use for breeding now as well. Uh, another sister species is Sophronitis wittingiana, and this is similar to coccinia, except the flowers are a hot bright pink. Excuse me, Peter, does yeah. that, that the smaller form have a varietal name people refer to it as? Yeah, the question is the smaller mini form, does it have a varietal to name? Uh, I have not been able to find any reference to it at all. Uh, I don't even know how it appeared or if it's possibly a hybrid between another Sophronitis species. Was your plant from uh, Machan? No, it was from uh, Tarian. Yes. Naturally, and not crossing it back to the normal size, so he's breeding for small. But it's a normal variety. Yeah. Decent. So this is Sophronitis wittingiana, and I typically grow wittingiana <coughs> mounted. Uh, it will grow in a pot, but uh, it seems to perform very well mounted. Uh, wittingiana is a much easier to grow plant than coccinia. Uh, once it is well rooted on a mount, it seems to just grow very, very easily. It's a little bit more tolerant of the warm temperatures as well. There's a couple more here. Uh, the flowers can be as large as uh, three inches across on a very, very small plant. Uh, Sophronitis cernua. This is uh, uh, the warmer, warmer growing of the Sophronitis species. And I know people in Florida can grow this quite readily. Uh, it's usually mounted, but it will grow in a pot, as you can see here. And it's a tiny, tiny thing, and this is a, a useful species to make the uh, micro mini cats that I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, this is a one that I got from Japan. Uh, they have also done some breeding with these where the flowers are very, very round and full. 
Here's another one here. Uh, now this one is uh, from H&R breeding. Uh, and it's performing very well on its mount. Uh, these like to be a little bit on the dry side, uh, so I don't try and water this uh, too often in the summer. Now, a good software nighter sunua can have up to eight or nine flowers on a single inflorescence. So uh, uh, you should look for that feature on these plants. Jesus. Yes. Wow. It hasn't bloomed yet, but it's really, I got a very tiny piece. Yeah. But they're both growing like crazy. Well, if that works for you, then that's fine. Uh, well, yeah. Right yeah. Um, I have had some problems with Sophronitis sunua, even though it's mounted, where I'll get a little bit of a rot problem that will start from the base of the bulb, and the leaf will turn yellow and drop off. Uh, and, I, and I've almost <laughs> lost plants to that type of rot. And I don't even know why it, what it, form, why it forms that way. Uh, the next species is Sophronitis brevipedunculata. Uh, this is very similar to Coccinia, but again, it's best grown mounted. The flowers are a little bit more on the red side for me uh, than Coccinia. Coccinia tends to be a little bit more orange red. Uh, and it, uh, it's a very small growing plant as well. Lelia pumula, uh, a nice dwarf plant, four inches tall, but a flower that can be as big as four inches across as well. Uh, Lelia aloreae, uh, very tiny thing. Uh, this has a, a nice feature of being able to bloom three or four times a year. Uh, and it forms its bud within an emerging growth, just like Sophronitis. There is no sheath. Uh, and so you can actually feel the bud in the emerging growth, which is a nice thing. Uh, there are a number of, uh, there's a couple color forms. This one has a little uh, rose pink rim around the lip, um, around the lip, rim of the lip, uh, but others are mostly pure white uh, or, or a light lavender. And there shows you the growth habit of the plant. It only grows about three inches tall. Uh, the flowers can be very cupped though. Uh, the petals don't fully flatten out. Uh, but the nice feature is that in breeding with it, uh, it seems to be a recessive trait, uh, and the flowers often will bloom flat. Here's another one here. This one has an AM. Uh, you can see it has a quite nice uh, flat open feature. Uh, Lelia bergerai is a repiculous Lelia from Brazil, and it has brilliant yellow flowers. Uh, Bratonia sanguinea, a native to Jamaica. Uh, it's a very small plant, but the spike can be about a foot long. And here's an alba form. Now, the, the nice feature about Bratonia sanguinea is the lip is very flat. It doesn't really form a tube. So it, Bratonia sanguinea is very useful for making splash petal hybrids because when the petal mimics the lip, uh, this flat lip uh, creates a flat petal stance as well. And Cattleya clandii, this is where we can use to make spotted hybrids. Uh, Cattleya clandii is um, a, a plant that likes to be mounted or in a basket. The roots like to be open and not to be contained in a medium. Okay, some primary hybrids. Uh, this is uh, Sophro Cattleya Buford. And that's a hybrid between Coccinia and Luteola. Uh, this hybrid was made back in 1962. Uh, and uh, the, the forms these days that are used in breeding are tetraploid forms that occurred in the cloning process. Uh, and this is one called Big Circle. Uh, and Buford has been used extensively in minicab breeding. There are over 300 hybrids already uh, with Buford. Uh, SL Polestar is Brejeri with Coccinia, and there's a one result of it. Uh, and you can see some latent flaring in the sepals and petals. That comes from Brejeri. And a lot of the hybrids with Polestar will exhibit that flaring. Sophrolalia orpedii is Coccinia with Pumula. Uh, this is a very old hybrid registered in 1901. 
but the plants to use these days are tetraploid <coughs> varieties as well, uh, including this one, which is variety Bonanza. Uh, uh, and this is a plant from Alan Koch. It's the first hybrid made in America. It is the first hybrid made in America? William wow. Pete, who designed all the Esplanades in Santa Barbara. Wow. Named after him. Okay, great. Uh, LC Mini Purple, Puma Low with Walkeriana. This is a classic hybrid. Probably many of you own this one. Uh, this happens to be a particularly dark one that was awarded up in San Francisco area. Uh, Jungle Elf, Catlea Clandii with Lelia Asalkiana. Uh, Lelia Asalkiana is a tiny little repiculous Lelia, and it produced this. And here's a close up of it. Does anybody have that for sale anymore? Uh, it's hard to find. I have, this is a Cheryl Lynn, which is a, a tetraploid mutation from, I think from Cheryl Asobi. Is that right, Roy? So I have this plant, but, it, but you're right, it's very hard to find. Uh, these are not the easiest plants to grow um, because of the clandii background. You have to be very careful about uh, keeping the roots alive and stuff, so. Uh, some early hybrids. Uh, one of my favorites is Mini Pet, which is Orpedii crossed back to Coccinia. And so it, the flowers are a really nice red color, uh, and it's you know almost almost uh, three parts Coccinia and just one part uh, Lilia pumila. And here's uh, the same plant a few years later. Those flowers are three inches across. Uh, Tangerine Jewel, uh, you don't see this very much anymore, but there was a, a tetraploid mutation of this that was used in a lot of breeding. Uh, Fred Clark used this plant, uh, but unfortunately the tetraploid plant is now dead. So I don't know if anybody has a tetraploid Tangerine Jewel anymore. Roy? No? <laughs> okay. Uh, Siegel's Apricot. Uh, this is a hybrid uh, made by Frank Fordyce, although registered by Siegel's Landing Orchids. Uh, this is a California apricot with coccinia. And this, this is a remake uh, from Fred Clark, because uh, it's been remade a, a few times. And here's another one here. But really nice red oranges. Uh, can't lay a little dipper. Uh, this one is used for making splash petal hybrids. Uh, this is a clone from Orglade, called Orglade Smooch. I think it's from Jones and Scully. And I think it's very appropriate because those uh, petals look like someone kissed them with lipstick. And Lelia Catlatonia Peggy San. This is variety Gold Country, which is, again is a tetraploid mutation. Uh, and see where the Rotonia sanguinea lip is very flat, and so the petals also exhibit the same flatness. Uh, some current hybrids that you might see today. So these are, uh, some of these are hybrids that Fred Clark has made. Um, Fred has been very prolific in breeding mini cats. Uh, so he combined mini pet with Beaufort and called it mini bow. And there's one example, and here's another. Mini Apricot, Mini Pet by California Apricot. A lot of these came out red, like this one and this one. Which California Apricot is that used? Orange, uh, orange Circle. That's a technical Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, this is a new hybrid from Fred. This is Siegel's Apricot with uh, Potanera Golden Circle. And they're coming out really nice orange oranges with some with red lips. <coughs> uh, Seagull's Mini Cat Heaven, Beaufort Cross with Tangerine Jewel. This is a remake that Fred did. Uh, Richard Stone. Uh, this is Circle of Life by Sophronitis coccinea. And this is my remake of this using my little mini coccinea. And all of the seedlings uh, were red. Uh, my suspicion is that this is a diploid, uh, and so you can see uh, the circle of life, which is a tetraploid, is probably even more dominant than the coccinia. 
There's another one here. Uh, Star of Life. This is my hybrid that I used. I crossed the Circle of Life with Pole Star. There's one that bloomed yellow with a red lip. And then this one here. See the red uh, flaring coming from Lelio Bergerai. Are, these fragrant? are they fragrant? Yeah. No, they are not. Uh, most of these, like I said, have either Sophronitis coccinea or, or uh, Lelio Bergerai in the background. And so unfortunately, there's no fragrance. Uh, Dreamcatcher, Bright Angel by Beaufort. This was made by Roy a number of years ago. Nice color ranging from yellow to oranges and even um, some reds like this one. Uh, Bose Apricot Gem. This is a new hybrid made by Fred Clark. Siegel's Apricot by Beaufort. And you can see the, the number of times I've, I have sh I've shown Buford as the, one of the parents. Uh, Potnera Little Toshi. Some of you might have uh, BLC Toshioki. Cross with Buford. Uh, you can see that it looks like a little mini one with the little flares. Here's another one here. Uh, Sierra Doll. Uh, Pink Doll by Walkeriana. And this is a hybrid made by Alan Koch. And there are a number of awarded ones on, from this uh, hybrid. Fuchsia Doll, uh, Alan Koch took it one, f one step further uh, by using Sierra Doll and Lelia Sincorana. And these were quite nice, large, almost four inch size flowers on a six inch tall plant. Uh, LC Sacramento Rose. This is one of the uh, uh, recent hybrids with Lelia aloorii. And you can see here how the flowers are, are pretty flat. Uh, this is my uh, plant of this, and th there will be a division of this in the auction tonight. Uh, and that plant usually blooms <laughs> twice a year, sometimes three times a year. Uh, splash petals. So m uh, most of the splash petal hybrids that you see today have this as a parent uh, in the background. And that's Cattleya intermedia variety of Kinii. And this is where you can see the petals are mimicking the lip both in a little bit in the shape and in the color. Uh, and so using this, uh, you'll get 50 to 75% of the seedlings blooming with splash petals. Uh, this is Dream Cloud, which is Little Dipper crossed with Orpedii, uh, and this happens to be a clone from Japan. Very, very nice splash petal. I love how the, the lip markings are right on with the petals, and it's very flat. Uh, Mary Song by Siegel's Apricot. So Mary Song is a standard size splash petal <coughs> crossed with the little mini cat Siegel's Apricot. You can see wild patterning on the petals. Uh, this is Golden Circle by Angel Eyes. Uh, this has now been named Potnera Dennis Rossinger. This cross was very successful, and so Fred has remated it a couple times and uh, will soon be releasing seedlings of this hybrid again. Uh, this is Rosella, Potnera Rosella Supreme uh, from Australia. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, very interesting because the uh, I like how there's a little pickety edge around the petals with a yellow splash in the middle. Do you get very many plants out of Australia? Uh, do I get many plants out of Australia? No. It's very difficult to get plants. Uh, Fred and I did an import once a number of years ago, uh, but we haven't done it since then. So this is from Rosella Orchids. Uh, they are a, um, a firm in Australia that does a lot of breeding of mini cats. Uh, this is SLC Angel's Fantasy, my favorite of the Splash Petal Mini Cats. Fire Fantasy with Bright Angel. This is made by Roy. And it had a lot of different color patterns. This is being one of them. Here's another one. And then this one here. So I have a fun story about this particular plant. 
the solar flare. Uh, I was at the Miami show probably almost nine years ago, uh, and that's the first time I met Roy. And uh, I was bedazzled by his display because he puts in really beautiful displays. And I honed in on this one seedling plant that had one flower, and it was this particular plant. And uh, I, as soon as I saw it, I said, I got to have that plant. So I had no idea, you know, um, who Roy was or his nursery. But I happened to talk to Claude Hamilton, who was standing nearby, and I said, I really like that plant. And he go, and Claude says, well, why don't you just ask Roy? He'll sell it to you. So I asked Roy, and he said, sure, you can, you can buy it. Uh, you can pick, you'll have to pick it up after the show. And I said, ooh, I'm leaving tonight. This was Saturday night, and the show wasn't over till Sunday. So Roy was very gracious and said, well, I'll send it to you. I'll ship it and send it to you. Uh, so the following, I got the plant and was so happy to get it. The following year, it bloomed with three flowers and it got an FCC on the first <laughs> showing. Uh, that's not the award slide, but um, that's, the, that's the plant from Roy. How much did I sell it to you for? Yeah. You, so <laughs> <laughs> you sold it to me for $50, <laughs> which I thought was a great deal. And so now Fred, uh, Fred is the only person who has a division of this plant. Uh, and he's using it for breeding, and the, he's produced a number of hybrids using this as a parent, and it's proving to be a very, very good parent. Okay, moving on. Uh, Tangerine Jewel with Cosmic Delight. Uh, Cosmic Delight is a hybrid of Bright Angel with Bait Maniana. Uh, and I think Roy has a remake of this in Compots, the Cosmic Delight. Uh, but anyways, uh, this is uh, named after Trudy Marsh. Uh, an avid uh, hobbyist out in California. And these are some of the seedlings that came from it. Uh, this is Tropical Star. This is one of my hybrids. Uh, Tropical Song crossed with Pole Star. And again, it produced a number of uh, varying color patterns and splashes. This one was almost solid red. And then this one here. Uh, Lelia Catlatonia Happy Face. This is uh, Lelia Peggy San with Mari Song. And that gives me a happy face when I see it. <laughs> really nice splash petal. Uh, this is Lelia Catlatonia Sacramento Splash. Uh, Peggy San by Little Dipper. This is a hybrid made by Alan Koch. Very, very successful cross. I happened to buy about 12 seedlings from Alan a number of years ago, and out of the 12, I have seven AOS awards to the cross, <laughs> including these are a couple of uh, the ones that I got awarded. Uh, now this is, uh, this is, is this my hybrid? Yeah, this is, this is one of Fred's hybrids, uh, Peggy Sand by Angel Eyes. Uh, you can see the really round feature of the plant with nice splash petals. Shape is very strange. Yeah, the column column does look a little strange. I don't know if it's coming from the Brotonia parent or um, maybe the angel eyes. <laughs> I'm sorry? Intermedias do that? Yeah. Okay, this is my hybrid. This is Pe Peggy's Dream. I crossed uh, Peggy Sand with SLC Dream Cloud and got some very nice strong flares on this. Uh, and these plants are all very compact. They're only about six or eight inches tall with three to four flowers on a spike. Here's another one. So the nice thing about Brotonia is that it, they are warm growers. So they'd be great for Florida growing. Okay, my last category before the, mini, the micro minis is spots. Uh, jungle eyes. This is Jungle Elf crossed back to Cattleya clandii, and we get even more strength and spots. So that's two shots of a clandii, and then one shot of Lelia Salkiana. Uh, jungle Gem, Jungle Elf with precious stones. And there, uh, some very nice cultivars came out of this, the orange and uh, yellow with spots. Are these good for 
Uh, these would be good, good as well. Although they have a little bit of sulfurnitis back in the precious stones, there's all a clandii in, in precious stones as well. So uh, you have a lot of warm growing uh, species in the background of this hybrid. This is one of uh, Fred's cultivars called Very Nice. Uh, this is cheetah freckles, jungle gem crossed with the standard size tropical pointer. And there's a one result and another one. And this one even has some red flares coming out. And there's another one. Uh, Catherine Clarkson, so uh, on the spotted hybrids, Fred Clark again has been very prolific in breeding splash petals. So he crossed Mark Jones with Jungle Gem. And there are some very nice compact spotted hybrids here. Now the nice thing about these spotted hybrids is they can often bloom twice a year. Uh, because of the SLC parent that blooms in the spring, and then the uh, other parent blooms in the summer. Sometimes the plants are confused to our benefit, and so they flower twice. Those get uh, these will have some fragrance uh, because of uh, a, both a clandii, maybe Leopoldii might be in the background, so there is some fragrance on these. Uh, this one's called SLC What'll It Be? <laughs> uh, and that's Jungle Gem crossed with a Cattleya penny corota. So now we're going to get both spots and flares. <laughs> Another one there. You can see the influence from penny corota, very strong. Uh, Sunco sunspots, jungle elf crossed with standard size spot Cattleya wine eye leopard. And there's this one. Uh, this one I actually have in bud right now, and it has six flowers on a single spike. One I leopard normally gets a big flower. Yeah. <coughs> the crab in the uh, not too bad. <coughs> what was his name? This is Catherine Clarkson. Oh, I'm sorry. Sun Coast Sun, Sun Coast Sun Spots. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Are these all bloom this time of year? Yes. Like the other spots. Yes. Okay. Yeah, but they can bloom er earlier too. So sometimes they'll bloom twice. Uh, this is Lucky Gem, Lucky Charms crossed with Jungle Gem. This is one of my plants I named Cheetah Freckles. Here's another one. And another one. Denji, yeah, Dendi's Gem. Jungle Jam crossed with Sun Coast Sunspots. Uh, and then Catherine Clarkson crossed with SLC Leopard Gem. This one was kind of cool. It almost has a white side lobes that contrast very nicely with the really burgundy lip there. Okay, my last category is micro mini cats. Uh, and I kind of coined micro mini cats as being the mini cat hybrids that are less than f four or five inches tall. Uh, this is Coral Orb. Uh, this is a hybrid between Sophronitis coccinea and Lelia aloorii. Again, very flat flowers for the breeding. Sophrolalia teensy weensy. <laughs> This is a hybrid made by Fred Clark of mini pet with Lelia aloorii. Again, will bloom two or three times a year on very compact plants. Here's one example. Notice how flat the flower is, even though the cupped shaped Lelia aloorii is a direct parent. Here's another one here. Uh, Sophronitis wildfire. This is actually an older hybrid of Coccinia with Wittingiana. There's a couple examples there. A vigorous hybrid that's easier to grow than either parent. Uh, Sophrolalia pink opal. This is my first mini 
micro mini cat hybrid. I crossed mini pet with Sophronitis wittingiana, uh, and they were really nice plants that came out of this. Uh, small plants that, that grew in two inch clay pots with a th almost three inch size flower. That one's three and a half inches across. Uh, and this is another uh, one of my hybrids uh, that I just made, which is Isabel Stone by Sophronitis wittingiana. And I found with using wittingiana, it's better to use it with other pink or purple colored flowers. Uh, when I crossed it with reds, the color seemed to be on the coral side, but not, not red and not pink. It was kind of muddy between the two. So uh, I'm now doing hybrids only with other parents that have either purple or pink in the background. Uh, Seagull's crawfish pie. <laughs> this is a hybrid of Breva pedunculata and Lelia pumila. And I just remade this cross uh, using those two parents. Uh, and there's the result. So it's very similar to Orpedii, uh, but I think it's easier to grow uh, uh, due to the Breva pedunculata parent. Uh, are they fussy about being moved on the bench? Yeah. I have not found them to be fussy. I mean, uh, when you say move, what do you mean? Unless the unless the conditions are drastically different from bench to bench, I don't see how why they would uh, affect the plant. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, a Japanese hybrid, Mayuki Little King. This is a uh, um, mini purple cross to Sophronitis breva pedunculata. Uh, and this is a plant I picked up last year at the Tokyo Dome Show. Uh, and that's blooming in a two and a half inch clay pot. And the flowers are a good three inches wide. Uh, this is an oldie. Uh, the, these are some of the Sophronetta Cernua hybrids, and this one is uh, variety Linwood. The cutest thing, that is in a three, two and a three quarter inch plastic pot. Uh, the inflorescence has uh, eight or nine flowers on it. Uh, this is uh, Sophronetta Cernua with Lelia rupestris. Siegel's Gumdrop, another Cernua hybrid. This is crossed with uh, Cattleya chocolate drop. This is a plant uh, that was awarded in Japan. Uh, and then uh, this is a remake that was just pictured uh, on Facebook last uh, two weeks ago. So someone's remade the cross. What was that cross again? Chocolate drop with Sophronitis cernua. Uh, this was a, uh, I think this is from Wenzel orchids in Brazil, Artin Senna by Sovereignitis Cernua. A nice yellow one. Uh, this is one, a picture I found in uh, Taiwan, also on Facebook. Uh, Wendy's Redstone by Sovereignitis Cernua. Very nice red <coughs> flowers. You can see how dwarf that plant is. Probably only three inches tall. Uh, Mirabelle Fleur, Sophronitis cernua with Lelia aloorii. Fred just remade this as well. Uh, SLC Yellow Warbler. This is uh, SLC Love Fresh with Sophronitis cernua. Uh, and this is a remake by Fred Clark. Uh, now you wonder why it was called yellow warbler because all of the, all of the seedlings bloomed out orange or orange red uh, but apparently there was one that bloomed yellow um, and it was awarded as well uh, and they so i guess that's why they came, named it yellow warbler now the interesting thing was this is uh, fred used my uh, cernua aria uh, as a parent the yellow form of cernua uh, but still all the seedlings were orange Okay, one of my hybrids, this is SL Tiny Star. 
I crossed pole star with Sophronitis cernua. And there's one of the results. <coughs> Again, in a two and a half inch clay pot, three inches tall, with about five flowers on it. This is another one of my hybrids. This is Angel's Fantasy, the, the FCC one. I crossed to Sophronitis cernua. And then this one here. Yes? Do you find that, uh, in my experience, Sophronite Cernua is a relatively short-lived flower? Does it, and some of the early hybrids were also short-lived. Does yes. it seem to last two or three weeks? Uh, the question is, uh, Sophronite Cernua tends to have short-lived flowers, and do the hybrids also tend to be short-lived? Uh, it depends. Uh, this particular hybrid, the flowers, about three weeks. Uh, but the one with Polestar uh, was four to five weeks. So it just depends on what the error of the parent is. Oh, actually, this slide was probably <coughs> supposed to be before that one. But there's the parents there. Uh, and most of the seedlings bloomed out solid, like this one. Only about 30% bloomed out with the splash petals. And this was the best one to bloom from the bunch. Oh, got my, I got my size out of order, sorry. Oh, and that, that's another tiny star uh, that bloomed out almost red. <coughs> okay, so culture. So where can you grow mini cats? Uh, well, you can grow them on a windowsill. You know, they usually are blooming size in a three inch pot or less, so they are perfect for a windowsill. Um, they are gonna need bright light, so east, west, or southern exposure with some shade uh, is probably good for them. Uh, now, because they're so compact, if you grow under lights, they're a good candidate for growing under light fix, artificial lights. Uh, of course, if you have a greenhouse, that's, that's always ideal. And outdoors, uh, if, especially if you live in a frost-free area, uh, they can live outdoors for most of the year or all of the year. The temperature range will vary depending on the background of the species. So the Sophronitis hybrids are probably going to want to live between a temperature range of 40 to 85 or 90. Uh, and, and then the warmer hybrids can be you know, 50 to 100 plus. Uh, but if you are growing the Sophronitis hybrids, uh, it is important to try and provide some cooling differential at night. Uh, light, uh, they're going to want standard Cattleya light conditions. So 2,000, 3,000 foot candles of light. Uh, if you're growing in a full sun area, 70 to 80% shade cloth is just about right. Water, uh, both quality and frequency. Uh, if they have a lot of sophronitis in the background, you're gonna try and want to use as pure of a water source as possible. <clears throat> Some of the other mini cats, like the spotteds, will do fine with just normal water. Uh, and then water frequency, like most Cattleya orchids, they do like to dry out between watering. Uh, so I find I, I usually water once or twice a week in the hot periods and then seven to 10 days in the winter time. Uh, the orchids will appreciate some fertilizing during the active growing season. Uh, so uh, any general orchid fertilizer should be fine mixed with your water. Pots and potting medium is a matter of preference in terms of the way you grow your orchids. Uh, if there are a lot of sophronitis in the background, I do usually use uh, sphagnum moss and clay pots. Uh, otherwise, seedling grade bark mix is also fine in a plastic pot. Uh, you can grow a lot of them mounted as well, as long as you have good humidity and you're willing to you know, water often uh, for mounted orchids. And the repotting I'll talk about next. Uh, the one thing I didn't have on here was pests and disease. Um, luckily, there aren't too many pests that will affect your mini cats. Uh, the primary pest is the unfortunate white Bois de Vol scale, which is a nasty, nasty insect. Um, uh, and they like to 
congregate in the crevices of your pseudobulb on your rhizome. So you really want to inspect your plants often. Uh, and it, it seems like the insects se seem to know where you're going to look on your plant. <laughs> <laughs> Just this week, I was looking at my Sophronitis collection. And you know, I, when I water them, I, I, I look at the plants, and um, they look fine. Uh, this time, I decided to pick up the plant and actually turn it around. And the backside was covered in scale. <laughs> Nothing on the front. <laughs> so I had to immediately go and do a spraying routine to get rid of it. Uh, but so you want to try and inspect your plants as often as possible. And because they're mini cats and they're small, you know, they're often not noticed um, as much as maybe your standard cats. So you do need to look at them often. Uh, in terms of disease, uh, the only disease that I've had is the kind of the bulb rhizome rot that can occur. Um, and that sometimes is due to watering um, practices. Uh, but uh, those at least are, are a bit rare. Okay, repotting. So uh, the best time to repot your plants, your cattleyas, is when you see new roots forming at the base of the rhizome. Uh, and also uh, when the rhizome reaches the edge of the pot, that's also a good sign that the plant can be repotted. Uh, the other thing is depending on the medium that you use, uh, you probably want to repot your plants uh, after two years of being in the same mix. So I took the plant out of the pot, and you can see that there are new roots forming here and here. Uh, and also the condition of the older roots is still very, very good. Uh, and actually the bark is actually still in good condition as well. But uh, I know that uh, that's not going to last long, so it's still better to Re repot with new mix at this time. Now when you're repotting your orchids, uh, you can also make the decision of whether you want to divide the plant at that time or up pot it into a bigger pot. Uh, so with mini cats, I often want to keep a, a little bit of a smaller size to the plant. Um, and so I've decided that this plant can be repotted, uh, divided and so I will usually look for at least three to four bulbs per division. And I will either gently pull them apart or sometimes it's better to use sterilized cutting tools uh, because sometimes I think I can tear them and then I actually do tear them and the, <laughs> and the pseudobulb gets torn in half. So cutting them at the rhizome is usually a better thing. And so I have four divisions here, each with a good uh, root structure, uh, this one probably being the smallest one, um, but it should still do fine. And so what I'll do is I'll get a, a new clean pot, I'll put the base of the plant, or, or the back of the plant, uh, to the back of the pot so that the room for the new pseudobulbs will be right here. Uh, you'll also want to put the plant at the same level as it was before. You, don't, you do not want to bury the rhizome, and you also don't want to have the rhizome sticking out in the air. And I will just gently use my hand and fill the potting mix into the pot. I don't use a potting stick or any kind of thing to jam the mix in. Uh, it's not really necessary to really pack the mix in. Uh, so I will just do that. And then these are, these are the four divisions that I made. Uh, and I make sure to label them. Because um, how often is it that we put the plants back and we think, oh, well, I'll remember what that plant was. Yeah. Just the next day, you'll be like, what plant is that? <laughs> so always label your plants. Yes? You don't use rhizome clips at all? Do I use rhizome clips? I do not. I have not had the need to use rhizome clips. Um, I have not had a problem with them wobbling. Uh, there are occasions when there's a, a division that has very few roots, and, and I will use a stake um, to tie it up so that it doesn't wobble. So depending on if there are just a few roots, you may want to use a rhizome clip or a stake to steady the plant. Does the one on the right have a bud on it? Ah, keen eye there. <laughs> So yes, it has a bud on there. And you know, you've probably been thinking, oh my, I would not divide the plant or, or, uh, uh, or repot the plant if it's in bud or in bloom. 
However, uh, the plant was throwing new roots out. So if I waited for this plant to, fl to bl flower and, you know, after three or four weeks, those new roots might have grown out and gotten longer and then repotting it after it bloomed, I probably would have broken the new roots off. So that it was still the best time to repot the plant even though it was in bud. I may have to sacrifice that bud. <gasps> I know I said that. <laughs> it's okay to sacrifice flowers for the better good of the plant. Um, but, uh, you know, most likely that bud will be fine as long as there was a good root system on there. Yes, Fred? Uh, yeah, the question, the, the question is do I remove the sheaths on the old bulbs uh, or uh, the old sheaths on the bulbs? Uh, I do sometimes. A lot of times I don't have enough time because I'm repotting lots of plants. Um, but uh, when I repot, I do inspect the plant and the bulbs for insects. Uh, and so if their general perusal shows nothing to be wrong, I, I'll just leave them on there. And you always pot dry mix? Yeah, do I pot dry mix? Yes, I do most of the time. Uh, I find that if I use a wet mix, it's harder to uh, get the mix into the pot. It doesn't just fall into the pot like if it was dry. Um, but there are other opinions about that. So a lot of people like to use a wet mix, um, but I, I don't. Do you soak your mix before you... Do I soak the mix? No. Nope. No. Nope. The only thing I soak is the perlite. I don't want to have perlite dust. <laughs> but that's just my experience. Uh, and Fred does the same as well. But uh, other people swear by having a, a, a moistened mix. Now the bark we're using is uh, a bark from New Zealand. It is not Orchiata. Uh, it's got a trade name of kiwi bark. Uh, it's very, very dry, hard, dense bark. Uh, and it actually sheets the water off at first, but uh, after a month or two, then it seems to be fine. But we've had really good success with this kiwi bark. Do you know about this? But kiwi bark, orchiata bark, same source, one live treated, one not. Right. Orchiata is live treated. Kiwi bark is just Tr old fur, but hard. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because I tried orchiata and I have really pure, pure water from a well. And as soon as those new roots touch that bark, it was just like you took a torch yeah. and burned them on. Yeah. And so I soaked the live, uh, soaked the orchiata for two weeks. You did, yeah. Before I did that, and then rinsed it, so I gave away my 18 bags of. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Fred and I have been using the kiwi bark for at least four, f maybe five years now, mm -hmm. and uh, we've been very, very happy with it. Yes. Okay, just some photo credits. Most of the photos were mine, but a number of them from Fred Clark. And then I'll end with uh, displays of mini cats that I've done in the past. Uh, I really like doing table displays of mini cats. Uh, and it just sh goes to show you the really jewel-like colors, and they just make a really nice feature for table displays. Uh, here's another one that I did. And then the third one here. There's a, that's the mini pet that I received a cultural and an AM on. Uh, I do have a website. It's simply diamondorchids.com. Uh, I have my email address on there or any other contact information if you want to use. Uh, I also have a Flickr website that I have about 10,000 photos on that you can peruse at your leisure. So, uh, and then I'm also very active on Facebook. Uh, and I usually post all of my posts to the American Orchid Society group page. So you don't have to be a friend of mine to be able to see my posts. So do we have any questions that I might be able to answer for you? 
Yes? There are a lot of smart Catholic people in the room, and I want somebody to tell us how the scale know what the back side of the is. <laughs> Does anybody have that answer? That's right. Yeah. And I'm doing big plan and you didn't know either. <laughs> yeah. So you you have you may have looked through the plans more recently. Yes. Yeah, he's just talking about uh, the size of the scale t in proportion to the size of the mini cat plant is a lot greater than on a standard size plant. And you may have to inspect your plants a little more often. And I am very guilty of that because I, I always say I have to actually pick up the plant, turn it around and look at it versus just looking at the front of it when I'm watering. Uh, and that's hard to do when you have a lot of plants, but it can be important to do. Yes? To, uh, to use, what kind of chemicals do I use? I use orthene wettable powder, uh, but there are probably a lot stronger types of insecticides, but uh, I've, I've found that orthene seems to work okay for me. Now I do do, I try and do three, at least three applications uh, a week apart to make sure I kill off any eggs and hatchlings that come out. Yeah, that's what I do, but, you know. Was this about scale? Yes. You know, there's a non-toxic uh, substance you can use called pocon. It's, um, it's a petroleum distillate that's used for shining for the dendrobe leaf. Yeah. Yeah, it's Yeah, it's called the brand is called Pocon, P O K O N, and it's a leaf shine product that comes in an aerosol can. Uh, usually florist supply houses will stock it. I think even maybe Michaels might have it. Uh, it is an aerosol thing, so you have to be careful not to get too close to the plant because <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get too close to the plant because the aerosol comes out freezing, you know, when it comes out. Also, try to avoid not using it during really hot weather and really cold weather because I've had problems where the, plant, where the leaves turn yellow because they, they get burned um, from the... Or you can use the other Peter Lens of Big Leafs Orchids Holy Trinity Formula two times a year and you'll never have scale as long as you live. And what is that? <laughs> it's very simple. It costs a fortune, but it works two times a year. It is one for every gallon of water. It's two teaspoons of distance, one teaspoon of merit, and a quarter of a te teaspoon of tetrasan. It works. Wow. Merit and... Uh, merit, one kills the live ones, right. one kills the ones that think they're going to be alive, and the other one <laughs> wipes out everything is it, else. Is it Merit, the non-greenhouse approved version of Marathon? That is yes, correct. correct. I, Marathon 2. And that is correct. Right. Okay. 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 That, okay. 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 That's, okay. that's the other Peter Lynn, the Texas yeah. Peter Lynn. Texas, yes. Okay. Two teaspoons of distance. Yeah. It costs a fortune. fortune. Then you have one teaspoon of Merit. It costs a fortune. M E R I T. Quarter of a teaspoon of tetrasan. What is it? Tetrasan is a fortune too. It's a little great. Ten dollars? About a hundred. No. For the big bag. It's dry, right? It's dry. They're all dry. Yeah, we'll buy it. I get my neighbors, my orchid friends. I buy it and then they come. I need friends like that. And they get their little things twice a year. You'll never have scale the rest of your life. Does it kill other things? It, I don't know. I've never had bugs, so it does. Okay. <coughs> I don't live in Texas. I don't even have roaches. <laughs> <laughs> you have another question? The, 
the question is, have I used a, a time release type of fertilizer like NutriCoat? I have not. Uh, uh, because I use the pure water source, I use a MSU fertilizer type for pure water. Um, so, and we usually water with every watering. A dilute fertilizer. Yeah, fertilize with every watering, except in the winter. Yeah, we do flush out the plants probably like uh, every fourth watering. Okay. I'll try not to use fertilizer on the fourth watering. But that's, that's for things in the bark mix. In the sphagnum moss, I'm much more careful. I very lightly fertilize. No fertilizer. It's yeah. No. Yes? That's... That's what yes, you do. Yes, what you you do. mix them all together, it's I guess. the Holy Trinity. It's yes. been around. Texas a and developed it about 10 years ago. And the other Peter Lynn, a big leaf orchids, <laughs> named it the Holy Trinity. Twice a year, that's all. And, and you mix that in a gallon Well, that's, it, that's per the gallon. Ratio. Per, that's the ratio. I have a big, huge sprayer tank, and you just spray the hell out of everything underneath, <laughs> blow, and let it all drip down, and everything's gone. And it doesn't even kill my tree frogs, believe it or not. You bring it out of there, out of some kind of a new hybrid tree frog that It's a resistant. Lynn, do you have a question? The question is, when does coccinia show new roots? You, for me, it's usually in the summer, early fall. Uh, but some of them do root after they bloom. The yellow ones do. Yeah, it, it just depends on your plant. There's no, doesn't seem to be a real rhyme or reason when they root. Um, so that's why you have to do everything you can to maintain the roots on the plant. I've had plants that have remained rootless for months, fooling me into thinking the plant is growing. Um, but when I unpot it and I take out the moss, there's no roots. So they, they can be a misleading plant for you. Yes? I don't know of what snails you might be referring to, but for the coccinia, there, are, there is a bush snail, can be a bush snail problem, because uh, there are tiny little snails that are about an eighth of an inch across, and they feed. They like to feed on the new root tips, uh, and so that's again very bad for coccinia because if you lose the root tips, you're going to lose the plant. Um, but uh, hopefully, you, you you don't have that problem. <laughs> the, the aria, is that really a cernua? The question is, cernua aria is it a true species? There is a matter of opinion on that. Uh, I have two varieties that came from Japan, uh, and they have nice full-shaped flowers. So there could be coccinia in the background, or they could be pure species. I, I don't know. Yes? Yeah. But uh, is there anything else you can spray that won't kill your pets, destroy your water aquifer, and kill you? I don't know. I, I don't know of any s solution for bush snails. <laughs> yes?
Okay, so she's su suggesting liquid metaldehyde in spraying your plants. Metaldehyde. Slug fest. Caffeine. So using coffee grounds. Might, might be another. Yeah, but that works for regular snails and slugs. These bush snails are already in the pots, so that's not going to probably help. Okay, I think we probably have to wrap it up. Uh, any other last questions? Okay, thank you very much.